Hi, this is Dr. Mikola Rashek of Merogenomics again, making another video update on mRNA vaccines. And in today's episodes, I wanted to talk about the difference between vaccinal spike protein versus the one that is naturally found in the virus. And the reason for that is because I found that there seems to be a lot of confusion about these differences and what that actually means from a molecular point of view. Vaccinal spike protein cannot enter a specific state which is called post-fusion and I'll explain that right away what it means so don't worry and that means for a lot of people they think that vaccinal spike protein is different enough that it cannot really replicate what the natural spike protein would do and that's not exactly how I understand things so I just wanted to give you my own uh, understanding of the molecular biology of the spike protein because it's really complex it's and it's just wild and i wouldn't be surprised if many people who are watching this video will be hearing this about the spike protein for the very first time so let's get started first we all know what the spike protein is it's this it's this uh, protein that obviously adorns the virus and it looks like a, think of it looks like a hercules club so there is this trunk and on top of that trunk you do have a you do have a head and uh, what a lot of people might not be aware of that the spike protein is actually made out of three different uh, or independent units they're all identical actually so these three proteins come together to create the final products hence it's called um, trimer and because the proteins that make up spike protein are identical it's called homotrimer and uh, and um, together they you can appreciate what an amazing design it is because together they create the final product and think of it each individual unit think of it like it's a snake with two heads and one head is what we refer to as an terminal domain and the other head is what we refer to as receptor binding domain and both of these are very important receptor binding domain especially is the one that the spike protein uses to interact with the receptors found on the cell surface of our cells called ACE2 and that's how spike proteins can latch on to our cells so that's receptor binding domain participates in that and N-terminal domain is also quite important and when you combine these three proteins together think of it like the the one head nestles or hugs the head of another snake so usually receptor binding domain comes right next to the N-terminal domain and they cooperate together and together the N-terminal domain and receptor binding domain form the head so that's basically what makes up the spike protein in a pre-fusion state that's really important because the name then the name suggests what it does fusion refers to of course the act of the virus fusing with our cell so the name gives gives it away it's pre-fusion and this is how the spike protein starts to interact with with our cells so as I mentioned a receptor binding domain is the one that's required to interact with the receptor as the name suggests and here's the tricky part a lot of people think that the conformational change is from pre-fusion to post-fusion and that's it but in a pre-fusion state spike protein itself changes shape as well and basically the receptor binding domain can exist in two states itself as well it's called closed state or an open state and basically if this is your receptor binding domain in an open state a, a piece of receptor binding domain shifts shifts a little bit and it and it juts out a little segment and uh, so I think of it like think of it like a flower that opens up its petals or closes its closes its petals except in this case you only have three petals so whenever you have one petal sticking out only when the petal is sticking out that's when the receptor can bind it it's one of the tricks that the spike protein uses in order for it not to be as easily recognized by, by our immune system and when the receptor binding domain switches from closed state to open state and it puts out this little fragment of itself so that receptor can bind and that's when the receptor will latch onto it and now we have interaction between the spike protein and the receptor domain now remember there's three of these monomers making up the spike protein so three receptors can bind to a single spike protein unit and now when all three ACE2 receptors interact with the three receptor binding domains of the spike protein what happens is 
they shift the conformation of the spike protein, they pull on that head, they open it up a little bit, and they happen to reveal what's underneath. And that's really where the crazy part is. A lot of people think it's all in the head, and it is important because that head interacts with the receptor, but the, the real diabolical part of the spike protein is in the trunk, it's underneath that head. So when all three ACE2 receptors interact with the receptor binding domains of the spike protein of the head, they pull on that head and they open up access for other natural enzymes that are found in our body to come and start cleaving the spike protein. So there's two of these enzymes that can cleave the spike protein in half. Literally, it's enzyme, it's like a molecular robot that will cut it in half. But one of them is furin. And this is, this is uh, one area it cuts. And once it cuts, literally you can rip the head off except there's enough interactions that once you cut it with the furin, the head still stays on. And the furin cut, and this is where the virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus has an advantage, that cut can happen within our cells as the virus is being produced inside our cells. It pre-cleaves it, and that makes it even easier to invade future cells. So that's one of the natural advantages that this virus has, is because it has this cleavage, it pre primes the spike protein to participate in, in the next invasion of the cell. Then a second cut has to happen, and this is already happening. That second cut is happening after spike protein is already interacting with the ACE2 receptor on our cell membrane. So there is another cell membrane protein or little molecular robot that walks into a place and cuts the spike protein again, and it cuts in a very special spot. It's called it's called fusion peptide uh, spot, and it cleaves it right there. And the name again suggests what it does. So peptide itself, peptide means it's just a fragment of a protein. That's what peptide means. And fusion refers to the fact that this element will be involved in the fusion with the cell that the virus is attempting to invade. And when that second cut, is done, the enzyme that is cutting it is called TMPRSS2. It's uh, not a name you would want to give to a kid, but a definitely cool name for a molecular robot. It's also called Tempress2. And once that cut, second cut happens, literally at that point, the head can be ripped off. So the spike protein head that we're so familiar with, it just comes off and the real monster is revealed from underneath because the head was shielding something that not many people are aware of. And that's basically underneath the head, the head comes off, goes away, and underneath in the trunk of the spike protein, you have these folded arms. And these folded arms start reaching out like cranes in, in, up above, and they start reaching towards the actual cell surface. And at the very end of those arms, you have this flappy fusion peptide. It's not, doesn't have any structure, it just flops around. It's uh, just a disordered chain of few amino acids. And then that floppy peptide, it weaves its way into the cell membrane, of our cells that the virus is trying to invade. And the moment it invades, it recognizes that environment and it changes shape. It just suddenly builds like an anchor and it's stuck in place. So that's how spike protein actually latches onto our cells, like a, like a vampire bite. And remember, I told you, spike protein is made of three identical units. So you have three of these arms and they just latch onto the cell surface one by one, boom, boom, boom. And you have multiple of these spike proteins doing it at the same time. And what do they do afterwards? After that happens, these arms start folding on themselves. And as they fold on themselves back again, they bring the cell surface and the viral surface together closer and closer and closer until they're so close they literally fuse together and they meld into each other and that's how virus can enter the cell and the moment that happens basically the cell is doomed so that's how i understand the spike protein believe it or not i'm not making up any of this stuff everything i'm telling you is what i read from science papers a lot of people are not aware of the fact that the real monster is in the trunk of the spike protein and not the head okay so how is now that different from 
This is the natural spike protein I just described. How is that different from the ones in vaccines? So vaccines are producing spike protein that is pretty much identical with one key difference. There's two amino acids that are mutated. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. That's basically how you put proteins together. And two of them are switched into the very specific amino acids called prolines. Now prolines, as a building block of proteins, they're really stiff. They're not, they don't really have a lot of flexibility. And these mutations are placed in an area that prevents the unfolding of the arms. And that's basically what locks ultimately the spike protein in the pre-fusion state because the post-fusion state is only after you already rip off the head, you latch onto the cell, you bring the cell, that's the post-fusion state. So this is where the vaccines cannot do, but everything prior to that, including all the way up to when the head is being ripped off, vaccinal spike proteins can completely participate in all of those biological processes. And that's still important. And the re reason why is because we are potentially learning that once the head is ripped off, that's not inert. That might actually have its own biological consequences. So whatever we learn about spike protein naturally post-infection with the virus, if we learn anything that might be of concern, yes, we would want to be learning whether vaccine spike proteins might be participating in that as well, because we want to make sure. Nevertheless, spike proteins from vaccines could be slightly different, even though they look identical, because there's one more thing that's happening after the spike protein is being made, and that's our own cells decorate the spike protein with sugars. And yes, you heard that right, sugar. So it's the same sugar you might be consuming, but it's from that family, family of sugars. And our cells will attach these sugars on top of the spike protein. And what kind of sugars participate in natural spike protein from the virus versus the ones we built from vaccines, that perhaps might be different, but we actually don't know yet. So that could be potentially a big difference. So that's what I wanted to tell you today. This is what the episode is about. Thank you for listening uh, up to this point. And if you did make it this far, I wanted to let you know. I believe uh, our COVID-19 um, Q&A seminar might be sold out check it out uh, perhaps the marketing director made some tickets available thank you for your support because that's really important to us and i wanted to let you know once again i have another event coming up uh, in few days only this is where three experts get together and we discuss three different areas of well-being financial well-being mental health well-being and i talk about physical well-being as it relates from uh, being able to access that information from medical dna testing so all three of us get together if you're in alberta email me and I will actually send you free ticket. Otherwise, we can open it up for free tickets for a first 50 people who subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, we'll send you free ticket as well. And if you like this video, give us a like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, good or bad, anything you have on your mind. And uh, see you in the next episode. Thank you very much.